Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another session of Back to Basics. My name is Dr. Viviana Samwa. I am a gastroenterologist in Katy, Texas, and a certified functional medicine provider. And uh, welcome to our group, Natural Gut Relief. I put some music on just to get the vibe going. Showtime, right? Um, it is Thursday night and we host Back to Basics every night. We've been hosting these informative uh, sessions every night, every Thursday night at 6.30 for several months now. And we've been um, having a really, really uh, good time, um, informative sessions. We've had several guests on talking about uh, topics ranging from leaky gut all the way to physical therapy for the pelvic floor, all the way to food sensitivities. We've talked about, uh, Nicole has taken us grocery shopping. We have gone inside of pharmacies to see what they're doing. So we've done a lot of things. And it's always wonderful to get on with you guys every evening. And so tonight is one of those evenings and it's my turn. Uh, we have, we work together as a team and we present different topics that we think will be interesting to you um, and our family or different topics that we think are beneficial, just, just a bringing awareness about uh, natural gut relief and gastro related issues that um, we've seen significant um, changes in the way we treat and definitely incorporating a functional medicine perspective, a more integrative and holistic perspective to all of this. So what, wait, welcome all of you. And for all of you guys watching on the replay, please enjoy, leave a comment. All your messages will be answered um, after as, as quickly as we can. Um, and for all of you who are watching and joining us live tonight, Thank you for taking the time and please post some comments in. Uh, I wanna make this as interactive as possible. This is a difficult topic, guys. We are talking tonight about uh, reflux disease. And uh, when I started doing the research, which I started um, a few months ago because I'm doing a presentation on reflux um, in a couple months, in a month actually, we, I discovered so many things, so many interesting things, and it was a great learning opportunity. So I wanted to share some of the information and I started off with one PowerPoint that grew into like 50 pages. And so the team said, split it. So that's what I did. So we're doing this in two series, this Thursday and next Thursday, because there's just so much information to share and I didn't wanna miss anything. So the first series is um, the five hidden truths of acid reflux. So things you may not have known, and quite frankly, things I may not have known as a gastroenterologist that I think over the years I've, I've discovered. But if you do suffer from acid reflux like I had for several years, and I still do if I eat the wrong foods, or you have been prescribed medications like acid blocker medications, PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, and they're not working or you're not getting complete relief or you have been on them for so many years and at this point you're trying to figure out what to even do, this is a great back to basics for you. If you know someone who's been suffering from any of these issues or has any of these questions, please share this with them or invite them to the group so they can watch, okay? So I've been a gastroenterologist in practice for about 10 years and I think one of the most difficult questions for me to answer any patient is why do I have reflux? Why now? Like I never had reflux before and all of a sudden now I have reflux. And for the longest time I would try to like just kind of, you know, say something, oh, maybe too much acid, acidic foods. And they were like, but I always ate these foods. Why, why am I having reflux now? What's the issue? And I would say this is probably one of the most difficult questions for gastroenterologists. I mean, if, if your GI doc is being really honest with themselves, although reflux appears to be our bread and butter, and although 20% of the U.S. population suffer from reflux disease, which is one in five Americans suffers from reflux disease, 
The underlying root cause, which is what we always try to get to in functional medicine or integrative medicine, at least in my practice, as to why me, what's happening in my body and why do I have this, is hard to understand and hard to express to a patient until you know all the facets of reflux disease, right? And what may look like reflux, but is not really reflux, right? So that's what I want to share with you guys today. All right. So stay tuned. We've got a lot, a lot of good information. I'm going to try and make it not too nerdy as someone. We're going to try and keep it like, you know, simple, easy to understand uh, so that you guys can you can get some questions and maybe some takeaways, some pearls from this. OK, so let me share my screen. I did present a little PowerPoint, but we're going to go fast. All right. We're going to share. And. I don't know why it says two monitors. So if you guys can see my screen, let me know. Perfect. So the title of this topic is Five Hidden Truths About Acid Reflux. Acid reflux is sort of like the, you know, what everyone calls um, the more scientific term is gastroesophageal reflux disease. And we often refer to it as GERD, right? So we're going to talk about some interesting facts about GERD. And here in this series, part one, I just want to talk about the why, why, why we even have GERD. So we're going to talk about what GERD is what the symptoms are, and then finally conclude with why. So this is a really, really interesting topic, guys. Hold on one second. Let me get my chair. I thought I could stand through all of this, but it's been a long day. So hold on. Yeah. We might as well get cozy and comfy right now. So... <laughs> So if you, I hope you guys can still see me. Perfect. Okay. So acid reflux is actually um, as a result of acidic or bile digestive juices coming from the stomach and backing up into the food pipe, like right here, if you guys see the pen. So there is gas, there are gastric juices formed in the stomach, right? And this is normally very acidic, right? And then you also have bile acids and bile juices, digestive juices that come from the gallbladder that digest fats that can also reflux from the small intestine into the stomach and mix with this and then reflux upwards, right? So reflux is not always just acidic. We call it acid reflux, but it's probably not the right term. Um, reflux can also be from um, an alkaline or bile or just neutral pH, but it's anything that refluxes up, right? And very often we'll talk about just acid reflux if you have it episodically. But when we want to talk about the pathology in itself, like this is a problem that I have all the time chronically, we refer to it as GERD, so gastroesophageal reflux disease. And as I mentioned, one in five people in the U.S. suffer from reflux. And if you actually look at the epidemiology, like the prevalence of reflux around the world, um, I noticed that it was really high in the U.S., high in some areas in Asia, also high in um, sort of the Southern Hemisphere, Australia. And then it was low in Africa. Maybe some of it was related to not getting enough data, a little bit lower in Canada and lower in South America. So very interesting to see that there is differential based on where people live, maybe related to diet, maybe related to genetics, who knows? So one way for us to distinguish if someone is having acid reflux as a gastroenterologist is we we, we, we very often we should start off with a diet, right? But a lot of people kind of want to know right away what's going on, especially if they have symptoms that are worrisome. And so we give them that acid blocker medication. So we say, go ahead and take Nexium over the counter for 14 days. And actually Nexium is over the counter. So, you know, most of our patients are already taking this before they see us or even before they see the um, their primary care doctor. But it's interesting to know that you can give Nexium or Omeprazole or Prilosec to someone who has symptoms similar to reflux, 
and they, but it's not actually acid reflux or GERD, and they say they're doing better. So it, it, it isn't really a good way to diagnose whether what's going on is reflux or not, right? It's because there, what we're going to see, there are many overlapping symptoms or, or, or overlapping pathologies to reflux. And so using the acid blocker medication or using the Pepsid to say, well, if your symptoms get better, then it must be reflux is not 100% accurate because there are other uh, esophageal or upper GI entities or pathologies or diseases that will get better to a certain extent with the PPI, but we're not treating the right thing. Okay, so that's interesting. So looking at why GERD actually happens. So something I always hear my patients say, and I think this most people know, is, well, the first question is, do I have a hiatal hernia? So we're looking here at the food pipe, the esophagus. Here is where that junction is between the food pipe, esophagus, and stomach. And this is where we often talk about that fake, um, I would, wouldn't say fake, I would say that imaginary valve, that trap door. There's really no trap door there. It's just a tightening of the muscles around this area that squeezes, and that constriction gives this allows for closure, which is almost like closure of a door, right? And so that's why we talk about that. A lot of people will say, well, is there a problem with my LES? Is there a problem with my sphinct sphincter? But guys, look, that transient relaxation of the LES sphincter is one of, I'm sorry, is one of like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine other causes or uh, causes or, or, or issues that could lead to reflux, right? So the LES is just 10%, only explains 10% as to why someone would have GERD, right? But let's look. The second thing a lot of people always bring up is, do I have a hiatal hernia? A hiatal hernia means, you know, imagine the diaphragm is right around here, right? A hiatal hernia means that there's a bit of your stomach that actually rolls up into that, above that, that, um, diaphragmatic level, right, it rolls up into the chest. And then, of course, it's almost like you have a second stomach in here that's that's just going to be sending acidic contents up the esophagus. So that's a second common cause, right, as why, why people would think they have reflux. But let's talk about the things that are not that common that we don't always think about. So let's start from the very top. When we talk about digestion and reflux and acid and everything, the esophagus must have a, enough lubrication, right, to move, to have those um, the, the con contractions and move and propel food, food downwards. So there must be good salivary function. There must be enough saliva from the mouth, right, that's coming down. So if anyone has any, if you've heard of an entity called scleroderma, where there's really dry eyes, dry mouth, um, and there isn't enough sa saliva to lubricate the esophagus, that can cause reflux issues, right? Because the movement through the esophagus is not good. So it's almost as though some food is always just sitting in that food pipe. This also explains esophageal mucosal defense. If there are any issues in terms of the esophagus lining, um, if there are erosions, if there are ulcers, if there's an inf uh, inflammation from a food sensitivity, yes, from a yeast infection, from a herpes infection, herpes of the esophagus can exist, yeast esophagitis can exist. That too will cause symptoms suggestive of reflux, can, can be part of the cause of reflux. So why things don't clear, the movement is not very good because the immune system and the barrier of the esophagus is weakened. This is really important. It's really, really important to, to understanding the root cause, sort of what is going on and why am I having these symptoms, right? The the resting pressure of the LES, so th this is that tra that imaginary trap door or that valve we talk about, if the pressure here is already too high and it doesn't relax, or if it's too low and it's always open, that can also cause reflux. Delayed gastric emptying, we often call this gastroparesis. It's almost like a sluggish stomach. So when you eat, solid food should be out of your stomach in like less than four hours, probably even less than two hours. But if the stomach motility, if the movement of the stomach is not great, 
things are just going to sit in the stomach. It's almost going to be every, every time you're throughout the day, you're always going to feel full and you'll always have the impression that you just ate. And whenever there's food in the stomach, you know, there's that brain gut connection. There's also a connective connection with the, the uh, small intestines that perform digestion. Your stomach just keeps churning acid. It just keeps releasing acid so that it can churn that food. So imagine you've got a ton of food sitting in here and you've got acid being produced and all of that is eventually just gonna reflux because it's not moving downwards, right? And then let's talk about the pylorus. So between the stomach and the small intestine, there's another kind of like imaginary trap door. And this area can also have issues with motility and movement and you can reflux. This is very often how bile from the gallbladder and in, in the intestines gets back into the stomach, right? Now, some people are form a lot of acid in their stomach or sometimes um, there are reasons why um, gastric acid secretion is increased. And this can be stimulated through different routes, one of them being stress, right? So if you're stressed out, cortisol production, more gastric acid is released as it stimulates the pyretal cells and the chief cells to make, um, to release those um, proton, uh, the, the uh, proton channels, right? The acid channels, that causes more reflux. And then that causes more acid, which will in turn cause reflux. But then some people also have certain tumors that produce gastrin and gastrin stimulates the stomach to make more acid. So if you have that kind of tumor, which can exist actually in your pancreas and it's secreting acid just on its own without even being stimulated by food, that causes reflux. And I think we've cleared it. We talked about the imaginary trapdoor, that LES everyone knows about, the hiatal hernia. And then, the, then of course, the esophagus not clearing well for whatever reason. So it, 10, 10 different causes, right? 10 different things that could go wrong with the upper esophagus, the stomach, and the pylorus that could all create symptoms of GERD. And these are all underlying root causes of GERD. So when a patient comes in and says, why do I have reflux? A good GI doctor is trying to figure out which one of these is off. And it could be two or three together. But which one of these is off so we can really help get to root cause and reverse the situation, if at all possible, right? Rather than committing the patient to a slap of a PPI forever, right? And we'll talk about that in series two, but it's as complex as this. So to my homies on natural gut relief, whenever you see a doc, a GI doc, no matter where you are and you have reflux and you ask the doctor, why do I have reflux? You want to keep this 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 little PowerPoint in mind and say, hey, doc, do I have an, an is it could it be my saliva? Could I have a problem with my esophagus? Could I have delayed gastric emptying? Do you need to do a gastric emptying test? Do you think you should be looking for a pep, you know, a gastrin releasing tumor, especially if the reflux is not you're, you can't solve it and you're needing you're needing higher and higher doses of the medications, right? So this was really, really interesting. So now that we've looked at all the causes, right? There are like 10 of them. It's interesting to note that GERD is almost never caused by the production of too much acid. It's not just because your body is just making too much acid or your stomach is making too much acid or you're eating too much acidic foods. That's like the simplest, most like, like it's just like just such a basic, overly basic description to a patient as to why they have reflux symptoms. It is so complicated, right? And so that excuse of, oh, your body's just making too much acid seems like an easy enough excuse to say, here, just take the PPI because your body's making too much acid, take the PPI and that's it, that fixes it. But y'all know, right? Natural gut relief people, family, y'all know it's not this simple. And my whole point here is that if the root cause isn't identified, yes, we will give you yet again another prescription, but that's not what we want because we're educated. We know we want to be able to, you know, be a part of our health and our health care and our journey and our, 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 you know, our wellness journey. And to be a part of that, you have to be educated. You yourself have to understand what's going on in your body, what's going on in that upper GI tract. So this is hidden truth number two. It's not always, it's likely never 
because of just too much acid production, many other causes. So some of the symptoms, this is where it's tough because some of these symptoms can overlap with other upper GI disorders. And I'll talk about those briefly. And some of these symptoms can be so severe that you may even think you're having like a heart attack. So we commonly see patients coming in referrals from, we get referrals from ear, nose and throat doctors. Why? Because our their patient is having issues with their throat, like clearing the throat all the time or coughing after meals, voice hoarseness, even sinusitis. Um, we see patients with ear ringing and even infections in the ear or just irritation in the ear from acid reflux, imagine new or worsening asthma because you're refluxing into the lungs and that's irritating the your your lung um, uh, bronchioles and alveoli. So we can actually hear some people wheezing and it's just reflux, right? Um, and this wheezing, if the, the reflux continues for years and years and years and it's not resolved, right? Um, and sometimes even just taking the medication doesn't stop that kind of uh, inflammation in the lungs because it's your, the medication stops acid, but it doesn't stop the actual process of reflux, right? It doesn't reverse the flow of the fluid, the gastric juices, right? It can actually cause scarring in the liver, in the lung called fibrosis, okay? Now, the common ones we all hear about are, um, of course, burning in my chest, burning sort of right at that epigastric, that crux at the base of the sternum after eating, usually worse at night, chest pain and tightness. Chest pain in the chest going all the way to the back can be reflux. Even going to the arm can be reflux. But it's always important to make sure you've had a cardiology evaluation that this isn't something else, right? Difficulty swallowing. Patients are like, oh, I can't swallow. I feel like something is stuck. Either liquids and solids. Most of the time, it's going to be two liquids and solids. This is because of spasm. Of course, the food coming back in your mouth, sometimes creating bad breath, we call halitosis, nausea and vomiting. So there's so many, many um, uh, symptoms of reflux and it varies. You know, sometimes it could just be the chest pain and the trouble swallowing. But if you get reflux, you know, three, four months later and it keeps going, it could be all the hoarseness of the voice, the change in the the tone and the timbre in your voice. So a lot of symptoms related to reflux. But then again, we see some of these symptoms in um, disease entities that are not actually reflux disease. So that's interesting. So if someone has reflux or things, they just have reflux, but again, they're having chest pain when they're climbing stairs or walking fast or doing activity, that's a red flag. That could be cardiac disease and they need to see a cardiologist, right? If they're losing weight without trying, right? They're just, they're like, oh, I, I can't eat. My, my, you know, my chest is burning. I'm losing weight, not really trying. We're concerned about an esophageal cancer or stomach cancer, right? If they're choking while eating or they have trouble swallowing foods, really like the food and liquid is not going down, it's important to, to, to actually go inside and make sure there's no obstructive lesion or obstructive mass, right? Or if they're throwing up blood or coffee grounds, red or black stools, then you're concerned about bleeding somewhere. And so when you see these, when someone presents, if you have these alarm symptoms, right? Um, don't just presume it's reflux. Don't just take medications over the counter. You've got to see your gastroenterologist, okay? That's really important. So hold on one second, guys. I want to just take a minute to see if there are any questions and I will keep going. All right, y'all can see me, great. Okay, so far, no questions, everyone is attentive. If you guys find this interesting, please put in a comment. Um, put in a comment, maybe say a five hidden truths uh, or just type in GERD, but just let me know that you are finding this interesting so I can keep going. It's really hard when I don't see the comments. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna keep going because I have some more interesting facts to share. And again, if you're watching this on the replay, Type in your questions. I'd love to answer all of them for you guys. So we're going to keep going. We've talked about hidden truth one, right? Reflux um, is not all about acid production, right? And we've talked about hidden truth two. A lot of acid reflux is not just acid. There's non-acid. So why are we taking these medications? We talk, um, there's so many hidden truths. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. I love this topic. All right. I'm going to go back to sharing. Great, I see you guys are there. 
I'm gonna go back to sharing and we are gonna keep going. Fantastic, so let's see. All right, I hope you guys can all see this. Perfect. So, let me see, I wanna present it in the large. Excellent, okay. So we just talked about red flags, okay? So if you guys have friends, family members, parents with any of these symptoms, don't let them stay at home just taking PPIs. They need to see a GI doc. They need an endoscopy. Okay. Hidden truth number three. In 70% of patients with presumed acid reflux or GERD, the EGD, the upper endoscopy, will appear normal. Okay. So the question is, should we be doing all the endoscopies that we're doing? As a gastroenterologist, you guys, I'm being very honest with you. I'm just being very truthful. Most of the time, we don't need to scope, do an upper endoscopy on most of the patients we see. We need to focus on those who have the red flag symptoms that we just went through, for sure, right? Or if we're evaluating for improvement in symptoms, maybe somebody who had erosive gastritis. You, you see, there's a, there's a phenotypic classification of GERD, which is how it can present. 70% of the time, meaning seven in 10 patients that we see who have symptoms of reflux, right? Everything we just mentioned, if you scope them and just do a scope, you're not gonna see anything. It's gonna be normal. You may even take biopsies and not see anything, right? And so then the patient's like, oh, there was nothing. You didn't see anything. I had chest pain. You didn't find anything. Because reflux is a dynamic process. When we scope you, you're laying on the endoscopy bed. You've received anesthesia. You're snoring. You're fast asleep. You're not eating or drinking. So we're not actually able to see the movement of what's going on, right? And that's really what reflux is. Remember, guys, we said it is the reflux of acidic or bile acid, just digestive juices, from the stomach into the esophagus. So do we need to scope so many patients? I don't think so. And a lot of our patients come in, I'm not gonna blame just us, the GIs, right? A lot of our patients come in and they're like, I wanna scope, I need a scope, I, <laughs> I need to know. But they're not presenting with any other red flag symptoms. So why are we scoping all the time? Now, if you suspect that someone, if someone has never been scoped and you're concerned because they had symptoms for a long time, I think it's definitely worth taking a look, especially if, when they're at, over a certain age, I would say probably 60, 65, you wanna make sure. Or if they've had reflux for so many years, 20 years and they've never been scoped, you wanna make sure that there aren't any erosions, right? So erosions, ulcers in the esophagus, that's actually evidence of reflux on endoscopy. We can see the scratches, we can see the ulcers, we can see, oh my goodness, this reflux content is actually irritating the lining of the esophagus. That is a nut, that's a, the phenotypic classification of GERD that we are most concerned about, right? That's the phenotypic classification that we absolutely must give a PPI the proton pump inhibitor, because at this point, we're trying to treat erosions and treat an ulcer. And what the acid blockers will do are two things. The PPI not only reduces acid, but it actually helps heal mucosa. It helps heal the lining, okay? Now, when we go in and what we find is NERD, non-erosive reflux disease, that's seven in 10 people, majority of us, we're just like, ah, uh, it all looked good. We may even throw in, oh, it looked a bit of gastritis. That's what we'll say, a bit, it was a bit red, a bit of gastritis, right? We'll take some biopsies and make sure there's no bacteria in the stomach. But very often when there's bacteria in the stomach, I mean, you can do a breath test and find out. So I do believe that we probably scope way too many patients that we need to. And I wish, and in my practice, this is what we're trying to do. It's not always easy, but instead of using the time you know, you, you've been paying the money using insurance to scope when we may not actually find anything, most likely 70% of the time, using that time or even the financial resources to focus on diet and lifestyle. 
really educating our patients as don't eat this, don't eat this, what do you need to do? And really trying to get to the root cause of why this person has reflux, okay? So I don't think just an EGD is enough, right? Um, if we're not sure about the diagnosis in my practice, we do, we offer, I usually will test the acidity of the stomach when I'm in there to see if, is this a high acid producer person? Um, you know, what, what exactly is going on? And even if they're taking an acid blocker medication, I still test the acid acidity of the stomach. Just using, I just get the gastric juices and I, I just use a litmus paper and I test it. Whether it's accurate or not, I'm not sure, but I've always seen it be kind of consistently um, collaborate or, or, or consistently kind of add up to when the patient is taking an acid blocker medication, I'll find lower acid, uh, lower pH in patients who are taking acid blocker medication, meaning not as acidic, right? So in the phenotyp phenotypic classification of GERD, this is really important, guys. NERD, no erosions, everything looks fine. 70% of us, erosive with ulcers, concerning, needs to be on a PPI, and Barrett's esophagus. This is the one everyone freaks out about, but it's just six to 10% of the population. And Barrett's esophagus is a change in the lining of the esophagus at the very end, at that junction, where that imaginary sphincter is, where the cells now change, have started changing from cells of the esophagus, looking more like cells of the intestine, because cells of the intestine can tolerate acid, but cells of the esophagus cannot. So it's almost like your body is doing some self-preservation and some adaptation, right? In changing the nature of its cells. It's like smartened, like, oh my gosh, this person is always giving me acid. Let me change the nature of my cells so I can tolerate the acid. The problem with this is that although the body's really smart in doing that, every time cells appear or start growing in an area that they normally shouldn't be increases the risk of cancer. And that's why we call Barrett's esophagus a precancerous um, lesion, right? A precancerous lesion. Okay. So interesting, very interesting. Moving on. So if it's not, if it's not um, GERD, and I hope you guys can see the slide well, what else could it be? What else explains the overlapping symptoms of chest pain, I can't swallow, I can't, you know, I, I, I feel there's something in my throat. If it's not just, and, and maybe, you know what, the acid blocker medication isn't working, right? It's not working. So we've talked about endoscopy positive GERD where they have erosions, right? Or they have Barrett's esophagus or strictures, ulcers. So it's definitely, this is obvious, this is reflux, we need medication, right? And then we talked about NERD, right? And this is endoscopy negative. But even in the endoscopy negative, you've got people who have no erosions and that's really reflux, right? But you just don't see anything. But then you've got other entities like non-acid hypersensitive esophagus. So in non-acid, if you give a PPI, it's not gonna work because the issue is not an acid issue. The issue is just a hypersensitive esophagus. And this, I mean, we can go into depth in this and I've, I've done so much research that it's it, there's a lot, there's a lot of information, but this is more part of the gut brain connection, right? And then there's acid hypersensitive esophagus. And then there's something called functional heartburn, which is almost like the IBS of the esophagus. It's a motility disorder. And this is very much associated, a lot of these, are very much associated to the vagus nerve. The vagus, so that, that there's a gut brain connection. We actually say there's an, a, a brain gastroesophageal connection as well, very connected to the vagus nerve. And this is where we may see symptoms of reflux pop up when someone is stressed out, just had bad news, is going through a difficult time, has deadlines, and they're not doing anything else differently, but they now start having all these symptoms. Right? So that's really interesting how we can actually distinguish GERD from the, you, the, the type you can see on endoscopy and then the type where nothing is seen on endoscopy, but there are different subgroups, almost like different causes to it. I'll give you guys an example. I've been working with a patient for over two, three years, right? And she had chest pain, trouble swallowing. And I was like, mm, this sounds like GERD. We had even done food sensitivity testing because at one point we saw special cells called eosinophiles in the food pipe 
that can be associated with reflux and can be associated with food sensitivities. So we avoided certain foods. She didn't really get better. And I kept giving her the acid block and medications. And at one point I was like, you know what, this isn't working. This is not working. Let's try and get to root cause, right? We had done several endoscopies, measuring her pH for 24 hours. And so we did one of these tests where we did an endoscopy. And I, I actually did a, what we call a Bravo study. And a Bravo is a little capsule that will sit right at the end of that food pipe, right? Right where that valve is, maybe about five centimeters from that imaginary valve. And it will stay hooked on the esophageal wall and it will measure your pH, your acidity. So this means how much acid is actually refluxing into the food pipe over maybe two days to four days. And we did this for her over 96 hours. And you, you, you don't wanna be taking an acid blocker medication during that time because it can affect the results, right? We, you don't want any medications. And when we did her test, it came back, no, there was no acid reflux. And so I was like, wow, no acid reflux. No wonder the medications didn't work, right? And we said, well, let's dig a little bit further. Right. So we kind of talked a lot about stressors in her life, anything that had been happening. She said, no, you know, this had been going on for a long time. And so we went even a step further. So, you know, you go from the endoscopy with the measuring the pH and then you, you, you want to start looking at, you know, lifestyle and everything. You look at that and then you want to start looking at, well, how well does the esophagus move? Right. We talked about some of the issues with the food pipe, clearance, motility, inflammation in the lining. And so we did a test called a manometry test. And this test actually just measures the pressures in the food pipe. And through measuring the pressures in the food pipe, you can assess how well the food pipe is supposed to be moving because it's supposed to be moving kind of like a snake, right? Well, her pressures were off. Like her esophagus was just like the pressures were so high. The esophagus was just constantly contracting. It didn't actually give this smooth snake-like move. And so everything, nothing really moved because it was just under hypercontraction the whole time. And so she had something called nutcracker esophagus. Did not respond to a PPI. I put her on the right treatment. So this is more of a neurological issue. I put her on the right treatment, which is actually a calcium channel blocker. And within less than a week, her symptoms were 40 to 50% better. She was like, oh my goodness, this is way better than the PPI. So it took me that long. I'll be very honest, guys. It took me that long because she always said she had some response on the PPI, but it wasn't complete. And after about probably about a month or so at follow-up, symptoms were 80 to 90% better. Completely different cause. And then she, you know, completely different cause. So, you know, we live and learn. We live and learn. So most common causes of acid reflux, right? The gen, if it's truly acid reflux, right? And nothing else, um, being overweight, even gaining 10 pounds will make that difference. Processed foods, um, we often think of, you know, uh, fast foods, right? Because of all the oils and definitely high carb foods. We, have, we don't think about that, but high carb is one of the things that have been shown, the types of food that have been shown to be associated with acid reflux. Sometimes even poor food combinations, right? Um, carbs with protein or carbs, with, that also can cause acid reflux. Smoking, because what smoking does is that little imaginary valve, it lessens, it lowers the pressure. So the valve stays open all the time. That's what coffee does to the valve. That's what chocolate does to the valve. And guys, it doesn't matter if it's dark chocolate or milk chocolate. That's what alcohol does to the valve. And that is also what spicy foods do to the valve, right? That they all act on that valve. Sometimes if there isn't enough magnesium in the body, the body moves very slowly. Uh, the, the gut moves very slowly. So taking magnesium supplementation, some medications can cause more acid in the stomach. Now, this is true. So medications like Mot Motrin Aleve and Advil, NSAIDs, or you may have heard of medications for osteoporosis like Fosamax. Fosamax is a medication that is known to cause, alendronate is the generic name, is known to cause acid reflux, causes more acid in the stomach. It also irritates that end of the food pipe. And that's why they tell people taking Fosamax to take it and then sit upright for 30 minutes, you know, before doing anything else. Because if you lay down, definitely lowers that sphincter, you're going to have reflux. I've seen food sensitivities cause reflux. I've seen celiac disease cause reflux. And I've seen SIBO or CIFO, so bacterial overgrowth that we talked a couple of weeks about causing reflux as well, right? So this is really 
um, digging to root cause is very important. So eating too fast, eating on the run, we all do this. Mindful eating stimulate and, and slow mastication stimulates production of saliva so that you can have excellent lubrication of your food pipe. Drinking and eating too much, filling the stomach way too much if you have a hernia, that's, that's all gonna reflux right back up because it's not moving down fast enough, right? Um, now there's a strong association between sleep and reflux and it's a vicious cycle because if you have reflux disease, it's gonna, it's gonna bother you at nighttime, right? When you lay down because you're supine and gastric contents are going to flow back up into that esophagus, especially if you eat late at night. But one thing we also know is that um, sleep disorders like sleep apnea also significantly increase your risk for reflux disease if it's not well controlled, simply because of the diaphragmatic strain when you have sleep apnea. So if you have sleep apnea and you have reflux, your reflux will not be fixed until the sleep apnea is, is fixed, until you're using a CPAP machine. And so if you want to quit using your PPI, you got to get on that CPAP machine, or at least you got to get evaluated for sleep apnea. Something I learned while doing the research, and this was awesome, is that the gut also makes, produces melatonin. Now there's a gland in the brain called the pineal gland that we know makes the melatonin, but I didn't know that the gut actually produces its own melatonin. And that also affects the movement of the um, upper GI tract, and then also affects sleep and, um, and, and the other uh, mechanisms. So we actually think that when you have acid reflux, we've noticed that when you have acid reflux, there is a deficiency or a paucity in the production of melatonin. And there are some interesting studies that were done in the sort of early to mid 2000s uh, by a really um, smart gastroenterologist in Brazil. And he actually treated patients with a combination of B B6, B12 melatonin for reflux and got excellent results. So I'll dive into that in part two. So bear with me and stay tuned. We've got great information about natural solutions to treating reflux in slide two. Huge one is stress, right? And um, this, this, you know, you can't say it's not scientifically proven, although there are studies will, that will say that it's not related. But I think the biggest evidence around this is when we, um, when I worked on the burn unit as a fellow and a resident in training, uh, we one thing that I learned right away is that burn victims who had, you know, I'm talking about third degree burns, right? Who had high amounts of cortisol in their stomach, in their, in their system, all suffered from something called curling's ulcers. And these are ulcers that would form in the stomach of burn victims just as a result of stress. Right? And when we talk about stress in today's world, we talk about those acute episodes of stress. But what we are all confronted with as, you know, as a process of evolution in 2021 is the chronic stress. And that chronic stress will also lead to this overproduction of, you know, that chronically elevated cortisol, which will stimulate acid production in the stomach and lead to um, reflux like symptoms as well. So stress is really important. And if the stress isn't managed, the reflux don't go away. PPI or no PPI, it doesn't go away. So in doing the, re the, the research, um, and this is hidden truth four, kind of going back to, it's not as simple as it looks. Reflux is not just about acid, right? That's one thing. Um, there, is, there are an anatomical components to it, right? Structural components to it in terms of um, uh, having a hiatal hernia or not. There's a microbial component to it in terms of, you know, do you have bacterial overgrowth? What's your gut microbiome looking like? How is that affecting the overall um, function of the gut? There is a nerve component to it, right? So the brain gut acids and access then the vagus nerve in terms of motility and how things are moving. There's a hormonal compo component to it, a humoral component to it, and there's an immune component to it. So reflux is complex, right? And the immune com component, we can even start talking about, you know, food sensitivities, um, celiac disease, all of these things that affect the immune system all of these things together cause reflux. So the solution of a PPI 
is a Band-Aid solution. Now, there are some patients who need it, absolutely. And some need it for a certain amount of time to get relief in terms of reduced acid formation and also healing. But long-term, if we don't get to the root cause, we, are, we chronically live on this medication. Now, in talking about those who really need acid reflux, I look at my slides, they're all a little bit funny. I think I was falling asleep while writing this. Some are in upper caps, some are, some are in caps, some are in lower letters, but 5% of our patients who have GERD chronically, right, will develop Barrett's esophagus. And that's that change in the lining we talked about. So everyone is very panicked about Barrett's esophagus, but only 5% of people with GERD will develop Barrett's esophagus. So it's not a lot, right? And for those with a history of Barrett's, the risk of actually this Barrett's turning into cancer is like less than 0.5% incidence per year, 0.5. It is so little. So it's not enough to scope everyone and it is not enough to put everyone on high dose PPI because everyone has this misconception that, oh my GERD is gonna turn into um, adenocarcinoma. Now, we, which is esophageal cancer, we know there's some people who are going to be high risk for colon cancer, uh, for esophageal cancer. They tend to be male, overweight, over the age of 50, Caucasian, smokers, drinking alcohol, you know, those, uh, family history of esophageal cancer, right? And if these patients have Barrett's esophagus, we actually want to scope them every year because we want to make sure it's not transforming. Those are the guidelines. And we want to keep them on, on PPI, right? Because we feel that this is going to be protective. But it's so surprising over the last five years, we've actually shown that for the first time, women will be happy that the risk of developing cancer from Barrett's is lower if you are female not overweight, um, um, mixed race, generally actually uh, Caucasians less than black, black women, but being female almost kind of has some kind of protective component. So this changed the American Gastro Association's guidelines in saying that if you are high risk, meaning the man who smokes and everything, you need to be scoped once a year. If you are low risk, a young, uh, a 50 year old Caucasian white lady or black lady who doesn't have risk factors for osteogenic cancer in the family, you need to be scoped maybe every three to four years, three years ideally. So if your PC, if your GI doc doesn't know this, please share this information with them. All right, guys, I have gone even way over. I will see you guys next week uh, for Back to Basics, five hidden truths about proton pump inhibitors, what you don't know, or what your GI doc hasn't told you, or your PCP hasn't told you. And I definitely want to give you guys some alternatives, some natural gut solutions um, to weeding off PPIs. I've actually put together a program. This is a four-week program. It is a step-by-step. -step. It's a gastroenterologist, my step-by-step -step strategy to safely wean off PPIs. It's a four-week program. We're doing this as a virtual group. We're going to provide information in terms of diet and nutrition, in terms of the right supplement. But what we want to do even before getting that, because you guys will see a lot of stuff online, oh, take this, this supplement, this, this, it's going to help relieve your GERD. But I think sometimes these things, you have to talk to a provider who understands what they're doing. Talk to your primary care doctor, talk to your GI. What's really important for me when I, when our our patients join this group or whoever joins this group is first to do this diagnostic gastro assessment. Do you really have GERD? What is the root cause of your reflux? And do you need to be off your PPIs? Trust me, not everyone can get off. Um, we definitely don't want people stopping right away. But in our practice, we have been successful at getting patients weaning down, weaning them down to either the lowest possible dose and I, I, I think everyone will agree with me, including Donna, that we've actually been able to get a lot of patients off the PPIs that didn't need to be on the PPIs. So this is a group we're launching in, in October, and I will share more about the group. I'm going to stop sharing. I hope this was uh, educational uh, to you all. I hope you guys got some great pearls out of this. Uh, yes, please feel free to watch the reruns. There's a lot of information in this GERD topic, and that's why I had to split it into two, because there's great information here. Thanks for hanging with me, guys. I know it's almost seven. 
It's 7.20. We spent almost a full hour talking about this. Watch it again. Ask questions. Um, and start, if you have reflux or know someone with reflux, start thinking about what is the root cause of my reflux? Am I being treated for the right thing? Do I need further testing? Do I need to be evaluated? And what do I need to do to get off these PPIs? Have a wonderful evening and we'll see you at the next Back to Basics, part two, 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 five hidden truths. Bye.